F64 all day long. Video, done. That's the best aperture to achieve maximum depth of feel and sharpness, right? Maybe? Isn't that why Group F64 was formed by some of the greats like Ansel Adams, Imogene Cunningham, Edward Weston, and others? If it was good enough for them, shouldn't it be good enough for the rest of us? In this video, I'll talk about two practical ways to optimize aperture in order to achieve sharpness while taming dastardly diffraction. Ah, <sighs> What would a discussion about aperture be like without first defining some important terminology? If you've watched my videos, then you know I'm going to keep this simple and practical. While I appreciate all the mathematics and physics behind optical design, I'll leave that to the lens engineers. I just want to move my little aperture dial and take some pictures. The first phrase that we need to have a good understanding of is plane of focus. The plane of focus is the plane in front of the lens where anything located on that plane will be sharp independent of adjustments to aperture. The second phrase that's important is depth of field. After a subject is placed on the plane of focus, the zone between the nearest and farthest points from the camera that appear to be in sharp focus is called depth of field. In other words, any subject matter within this zone or depth of field will appear focused on the film plane. Conversely, objects outside of this zone or depth of field will appear to be defocused on the film plane. When only the main subject appears sharp, then we say that the depth of field is shallow, like in this picture. If a scene appears to be sharp from the foreground to the background, then we say that there is a deep or great depth of field, like in this picture. It's important to note that the outer boundaries of depth of field do not have a precise point where sharpness abruptly cuts off, but rather there is a gradual tapering of focus beginning immediately after the plane of focus. In other words, only the objects located above, below, to the right, and to the left on the plane of focus are going to be critically sharp. As objects are located away from the plane of focus, they gradually take on a softer appearance, but still remain acceptably sharp. At some point, the softness of these objects might be visually unacceptable and thus would be considered to have exceeded the boundaries of the depth of field. So how do we control depth of field? There are three practical factors that us photographers can tangibly manipulate that affect depth of field. The first factor within our control is the distance from the camera position to our subject, or more precisely said, the lens to subject distance. The farther away our subject is from the lens, the greater the depth of field. Conversely, the closer our subject is to the camera, the shallower the depth of field becomes. Of course, moving the camera position closer or farther away also changes the composition and relative perspective of the objects in our scene. Hence, that may not work for the image we are trying to achieve. Not to mention that sometimes space may be limited and there may not be any room to move the camera around in the location that you were trying to shoot in. What are we to do with our ridiculously huge cameras? <sighs> But what if we change the focal length to change the depth of field? Aha! That's the second factor within our control. Changing the focal length used also alters the depth of field. By setting the camera at a specific location and not changing the subject to lens distance, the depth of field becomes shallower as the focal length increases. So when you switch from a 150 millimeter lens to a 300 millimeter lens, less of the scene on the film plane will appear acceptably sharp. Again, that assumes you didn't move the camera position. That's an important variable that cannot be changed for this optical principle to remain true. It's very tempting to use focal length to change the depth of field, but ultimately that's going to change the composition and the relative size of objects on the film plane. It's also tempting to try to use shorter focal lengths in combination with moving closer to objects so that they approximate the composition of a longer focal length in an attempt to increase the depth of field. 
However, if the size of the object on the ground glass is maintained between two focal lengths, then the reproduction ratio is maintained. Thus, the depth of field wouldn't change and you would still have to deal with setting the aperture and making decisions about what camera movements are needed. You can't have it both ways. Depth of field only increases if the camera position doesn't change because you maintain the subject to lens distance. So relying on this to manipulate depth of field might just increase your frustration level. That's not just a large format issue, by the way. That applies to all conventional photographic formats. Just as a side note, the smaller that the reproduction ratio is, the shallower the depth of field will be. But wait a minute, I own a view camera and I can use movements to adjust how the rays of light hit the film plane. Yes indeed, I have a whole video on how swings and tilts can be used to change the plane of focus which subsequently changes where the depth of field is positioned. If you haven't seen that video yet, I'll leave a link to it in the description so you can get up to speed on that topic. Okay, so. You've picked your favorite spot where you want your camera to be. You've chosen your favorite focal length and you've applied swings and tilts as deemed necessary. But you're still not satisfied with the depth of field. What are you to do? The transition to the third aspect that affects depth of field that I'm executing as I speak assumes that we are attempting to shoot wide open. I know, for those of us that shoot landscape photographs, we more than likely won't be shooting wide open, and you probably also know that we can alter aperture. I guess humor me and just play along. Ready? <laughs> the third factor that affects depth of field that we can control is lens aperture, also known as f-stop. Lenses contain a group of metal leaves or blades called a diaphragm that allows the photographer to manipulate the number of light rays entering the lens by changing the size of the opening. That opening in the center of the diaphragm is called the aperture. The bigger the aperture or opening, the smaller the corresponding f-stop number. So if the maximum lens aperture is f5.6, that means that the opening is big and can allow a good number of light rays to pass through the lens. Shooting at the maximum aperture, like f5.6, is referred to as shooting wide open. Selecting larger apertures is called opening up the lens. Conversely, as the aperture or opening is reduced in size, the corresponding f-stop numbers increase. So if the minimum lens aperture is f64, then the opening is rather small and lets in fewer light rays. Selecting smaller apertures is called stopping down the lens. Confusing, right? <laughs> The bigger the opening, the smaller the corresponding f-stop number. Just remember that the aperture refers to the size of the opening and that the f-stop numbers are inversely related to that corresponding opening. This picture is a classic way to demonstrate the inverse relationship between aperture and f-stop numbers. If this concept is relatively new to you, I would highly recommend pausing the video here so that you can study this relationship more diligently. More importantly is to understand that as the aperture is decreased from f5.6 to let's say f64, the depth of field increases. So if I want to expand the depth of field so that more of the scene is considered to be acceptably sharp, then I just pick a larger f-stop number, which corresponds to a smaller aperture. Please note that the depth of field is typically larger behind the plane of focus. Great! f64 all the way every time I shoot to get the maximum amount of perceived sharpness in my images. One and done. <sighs> I wish it were that simple. What would that be like? Yeah. Wake up, Tony! That dastardly diffraction needs to be addressed. Diffraction? What? Yes. There's that. As light rays pass through the aperture, some of the rays strike the edges of the diaphragm, which subsequently causes those rays to scatter in an unfocused manner similar to lens flares or a poor functioning hose nozzle that sprays in directions it's not supposed to. <laughs> this is referred to as diffraction, which has the effects of decreasing contrast and resolution in an image. 
Since diffraction only happens at the edges of the diaphragm blades, how much it degrades the image quality is dependent upon the proportion of rays of light hitting the diaphragm blades versus the number of rays passing unaltered through the aperture. At larger apertures, there are more rays of light passing unaltered than there are rays striking the edges of the diaphragm. In other words, the surface area of the diaphragm is less compared with the opening or aperture. Thus, the proportion of diffracted light will be less. So the take home message is that as we stop down the lens by selecting smaller apertures, so bigger f-stop numbers, we increase the amount of diffraction in our images. Jeez, us photographers can't catch a break. Well, it's not all that bad. The first thing to remember is that with large format lenses, the sharpest apertures to use are generally middle apertures. In particular, f22 is considered the sharpest. In fact, large format lens manufacturers report all their lens specs at f22. Go figure, right? The next thing to consider is how big of a print are you going to make? In a reference standard 8x10 contact print, you more than likely won't notice diffraction. However, if you go ridiculously huge with your prints like I like to do, then you'll see the effects of diffraction a little more. The other consideration is film size because smaller formats take more enlargement than larger film. For example, to make equivalent size prints, a 4x5 piece of film has to be magnified four times as much as an 8x10 piece of film, so diffraction will be a little bit more noticeable. Just remember, this video is about optimizing the aperture and not using tactics like depending upon film size to hide diffraction. But even with big film, the appearance of diffraction all depends upon your viewing distance of that print. The closer you get to the print, the more noticeable diffraction gets. For example, this is a 4x5 transparency that I printed ridiculously huge at 40 inches wide by 60 inches high. I shot this image at an aperture of, dare I say, F64? Did I ruin my image by stopping down? While some may say yes, I say heck no. At a viewing distance of five feet so that the entire image is visible and I can get an immersive experience, everything looks acceptably sharp and detailed. It's only when I get about two feet from the print that I see a mild softness to the image. But at that point, I'm staring at a one foot by one foot square that doesn't let me appreciate the essence of this image. I like to let my eyes wander around the image and at such a close distance, that's not possible without moving your head around. Personally, I'd rather stop down the aperture to increase my depth of field at the sacrifice of any minimally significant effects from diffraction. But that's just me. <laughs> by the way, if you want to see how this image was made by Maxar Productions, I'll leave a link to that video in the description. At this point, you are probably ready to hear what my technique for setting the optimal aperture is that strikes a balance between sharpness and diffraction, right? <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk about two techniques. The first of which is the one I've used the most because it is what I learned at Appalachian State University in my undergraduate large format photography class with Professor John Scarlatta. After I've applied all my movements at a wide open aperture, I simply reach around to the shutter while I'm under the dark cloth and check the ground glass with my focusing loop. As I'm checking each area of the projected image, I slide the aperture dial between the larger and smaller f-stop numbers to visually see when that area becomes acceptably sharp. Once I've checked the entire scene, I leave the aperture dial set to where I noticed all areas to be acceptably sharp. Then I look at the aperture dial to see where I landed and put that value into my light meter to get the correct exposure. That's it, the ground glass is truth. For me, on 8x10 film, I'm usually at f45 or f64 when I employ this technique. Of course, with smaller lens apertures, this can be a little tricky to accomplish in dimly lit situations. Not to mention that our own visual acuity could limit our ability to achieve the depth of field we are after. So, being gifted with good eyesight or the correct prescription for your glasses are really important considerations. I learned that get the prescription right lesson the hard way, but that's an entirely different discussion. 
Right about now, you may be saying, Tony, your approach seems like a stop down the aperture and hope for the best tactic. <laughs> is there a more methodical approach that I can take? Fortunately, there is. In 2019, I met a wonderful and very prolific large format landscape photographer by the name of Alex Burke. He is incredibly knowledgeable about photography, but very practical, which, as you may have guessed, significantly resonates with me. In his blog post from March 17, 2021, Alex describes a very methodical way of obtaining the optimal aperture so that we don't stop the lens down unnecessarily, which of course would minimize the contribution of diffraction to our image. The key to his method is to use a scale of measurement. Since most field cameras don't have a measurement scale, you have to fabricate one and install it on your camera. Doesn't that sound like fun? <laughs> Thankfully, Alex has been gracious enough to provide us large format photographers with downloadable files so we can just print the scales and affix them to our cameras. So that's exactly what I did. Done. I'll leave a link to Alex's focus scales and blog on this topic in the description. Now, what do I do with these scales? How does this help me optimize my aperture selection? This is so cool. I am very excited to share this with all of you. What you do first is focus on the farthest object in your scene. Then come out from under the safety of the dark cloth and make note of how far the focusing bed moved by using the scale, which is in millimeters. Then go back to the ground glass and focus on the closest object in your scene. Once again, come out from under the dark cloth and check the scale for how many millimeters the focusing bed has traveled. The difference in millimeters of how far the focusing bed moved between the farthest and closest objects is what Alex refers to as the focus spread, which is sometimes called the depth of focus. For example, I might focus on a distant object and note that the corresponding scale value is 10 millimeters. When I focus on the nearest object, the corresponding scale value might now be 15 millimeters. Thus, the difference between these two points on the focus bed, or more simply put, the focus spread, is 5 millimeters. It's important to note that the millimeter difference, so the focus spread, is the critical factor, and not the millimeter position on the scale of the focusing bed. In this example, the 10 and 15 millimeter positions could have been located at 80 and 85 millimeters on the scale. That doesn't change the focus spread of 5 millimeters. The next step is to use this reference chart to determine the corresponding optimal aperture to achieve the desired depth of field while minimizing the contribution of diffraction to your image. Please note that the acceptable aperture column is useful in situations where you need a faster shutter speed at the sacrifice of some loss of depth of field at the outer boundaries. Like when you attempt shooting large format in windy conditions. But wait, there's just one more step. You place the focusing bed halfway between the two points in your focus spread. So in this example, the focus bed should be positioned at 12.5 millimeters on the scale and the aperture set to f45. Brilliant! I love it! <laughs> and it's so easy. Why can't everything with large format be this simple, right? <laughs> I wish I had learned this technique sooner in my large format journey. To make things even better, this clever little technique works on all large format camera sizes, focal lengths, and with camera movements. One and done. <laughs> Finally. Interestingly, the focus spread method of selecting aperture is based off of calculations that take into consideration the very contentious topic of the circle of confusion. In other words, lots of in-depth calculations to arrive at correlating the focus spread to that of optimal aperture. Look at that. We didn't even have to use complicated mathematics to select the optimal aperture and put that concept to work. So that's the last I'll mention of it. However, if you want to expand your cerebral neuronal connections and force neural plasticity, I'll leave a link to a nice article explaining the mathematical derivations from the creator of largeformatphotography.info, QT Luang, in the description. Also, please consider following Alex Burke on Instagram and checking out his tremendous portfolio on his website. Okay. 
Should we have a quiz on all that information? <laughs> all right, let's wrap up this video. If you've enjoyed learning from me or you were simply entertained by my silliness, please like this video and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Let's make this channel ridiculously huge. As always, thanks for watching.